with I, Isaiah 33, we are halfway done with the book. You thought we've been studying for a while. We have, but we're halfway done. So we have 33 more chapters starting tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to do these two chapters. And yes, it seems like a big pill to swallow, especially with the content of these two chapters. There's some really fun content to study. Uh, but really it's not too complicated. Uh, it is fun. There's a lot of cross-references to some of them. Uh, but especially in 34, it's not too deep. And so uh, we'll try to get through it as, as best as we can. Uh, these two chapters go together. That's why I wanted to, to teach them together. They, they go together. It's a single prophecy, and it's a juxtaposition between God's judgment and His kingdom, which we've seen over and over again in this section of Isaiah, where it talks about the judgment God's going to give to the earth. And then at the end of the chapter, every chapter, there's, there's a few verses of this hope of this glorious kingdom, this peace and quiet forever, as we saw in chapter, I think, 30 or 31. And so uh, here we have the same juxtaposition as this conclusion to this section, but you have a whole chapter talking about this kingdom, 10 verses. And then in chapter 34, it's this judgment, which is the worldwide uh, annihilation of evil and wickedness. And so it's this ultimate destruction and judgment and this ultimate glory in chapter 35. I want to, however, turn first to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. As we began this section in Isaiah that started with chapter 28, from 28 to 35, dealing with these times of refreshing. Remember how we define the time of refreshing as this time after a long journey. That's where you get refreshed, right? You journey through the wilderness, you journey through perhaps a time of trouble, and you reach a time of refreshing. And Peter talks about that, and so does Isaiah. Isaiah spoke about the time where Israel would wander through this time of trouble and would arrive in this time of refreshing. Here, of course, would be the time of trouble, this tribulation, as the New Testament calls it, as the Old Testament calls it, as Peter spoke about in Acts chapter 2 and 3. It would be a coming time of trouble, judgment, before the times of refreshing. Now in Acts chapter 3, let's read through these few verses. 3 verse 19, he says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So the Lord appears before the time of refreshing. He brings the time of refreshing. Amen. And so here's this time where there's going to be a judgment for the sins of these people. So he says, repent before the appearing of the Lord, so you can enter the time of refreshing and not be the victims of the judgment that will happen at the time of the appearing of the Lord. Look at verse 20. He says, he shall send Jesus Christ, that's the sending there, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. With God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Which we often emphasize the last part of that verse to contrast it with the mystery. But the first part of that verse says the heaven must receive Jesus. He's in heaven until when? It says according to prophecy, the times of restitution. So the prophetic timeline before the time of refreshing is this time that we're going to talk about tonight in these two chapters, the time of restitution. And you know it's a different time because the word restitution and refreshing are different. Refreshing, that's good. It's good to be refreshed. Restitution? Well, it depends what side of the aisle you are on for that. I mean, if you're the person that needs to get paid back, then that's good. But if you're the person that needs to pay up, that's bad. You see? And this is what's happening here. The time of restitution is, is the time of the Lord's return to set things right. Yes. Thus refreshing. So distinguish those and read that again what Peter said. Heaven receives him until the time of his needing to restitute and restore all things. And after that, the judgment and the time of refreshing. And so Peter's not just throwing around language here. He's referring to what the prophets spoke about, and specifically in Isaiah in this section, Isaiah 34 and 35, deal with, as a unit, these two chapters, the time of restitution. Restitution means payback, vengeance, or setting things right. And chapter 34 is all about the day of the vengeance of the Lord, right? And why is the Lord dishing out this vengeance on the earth? To make things right. Right? To get rid of the evil and set things right. Now chapter 35 is the other part of restitution, which is that if we're going to get rid of the evil, we're going to restore that which is right. And so 35 is Israel finally coming into their, na their, their blessed nation. Right? And Israel finally becoming, uh, coming into uh, uh, the, the land that God had promised and getting their healing and everything else. And so the things that God had promised them, they get in chapter 35. So this is all this time of restitution where God knocks down the wickedness of the world and, and punishes and judges in his vengeance and then uh, brings Israel into their land. And finally there's a time of refreshing 
on the earth. Okay? So that's these two chapters. That's why I'm going to teach them as a unit so we can get that contrast during this time. So let's start in Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35. It says, the wilderness, or I'm sorry, 34, excuse me, Isaiah 34. Let's give the whole chapter there. Come near ye nations to hear and hearken ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. Now this is an interesting verse because similar to Isaiah chapter 1 verse 2. Remember at the very beginning of the book? That was a long time ago. Where Isaiah appeals to heaven and earth and everybody listen up. I'm about to tell you something. That's kind of what he's saying here, isn't it? Come near ye nations, all of them, to hear. Hearken ye people. Let the earth hear. All that are there in the world, all things. Listen to this. This is prophecy to everybody, right? And what's the prophecy about? Verse 2, the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. In fact, we'll see it's not just upon all nations, but heaven and earth are included. There's a universal cataclysmic judgment of God's vengeance going on in Isaiah 34, okay? Because he's restoring all things. He's going to set things right. And so this indignation upon all nations, all nations, uh, we see down in verse 8, it even defines it very clearly, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. Recompense, restitution, right? I'm going to pay back, compensate God for all the wrongs that people have done him and pay back the covenant promises that God owes Israel. You see, it's, it's all involved here in this judgment. That's why he does these things. Look at Isaiah 61 verse 2. I got to show you this as well, because when we talk about the day of the vengeance of the Lord, it's important to realize that if this is happening at the coming of the Lord, and Jesus' first coming was still future from Isaiah 34, the question would be, well, why didn't all this happen when Christ came the first time? Right? Isaiah 61 says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek, he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Does that sound familiar? Jesus read from that at the beginning of his ministry in Luke chapter 4, and he stopped right where I stopped on a comma. He did not read, and the day of the vengeance of our God. Because what Jesus came to do the first time was not to deliver vengeance. He came... To preach verse 1 in the first part of verse 2. The day of vengeance, which of course studying tonight in chapter 34, comes later. Right? He didn't come to set things right then. He came to preach salvation and, pre and preach himself as the king and the coming kingdom. He didn't come to set things right then. But he will come to set things right. Okay? So you see in Isaiah 61 verse 2, this day of vengeance of, of our God is mentioned here. To comfort all that mourn. Why would the day of vengeance be a comfort? Well, we'll see that in Isaiah 35. As Isaiah 34 is the day of vengeance upon all those who receive the vengeance. 35 is the perspective of those who get comforted by his return. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And we'll see that in Isaiah 35, verse 9 and 10. Let's go back to Isaiah 34. So verse 1 and 2, then, we see the context. The whole universe, the whole world is the audience here. The indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, the day of his vengeance, his fury upon all their armies. Notice how often the word all is used. All that is there in verse 1, all things that come forth. He says all the nations in verse 2, his, his fury is upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. It's only going to get more graphic. It's a very vivid depiction of God's judgment in this chapter. Okay, that we'll see alludes to some past judgments he's given. He says in verse 3, Their slain also shall be cast out, their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. Say, so what in the world does that even mean? There's going to be so many bodies and so much blood that they can melt the mountains. That's, that's the figure of speech there, right? You know, water, you know, destroys rocks and, 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 and dirt and hills, this sort of thing. And blood's going to be there. There's so much blood. In Revelation chapter 14 and 21, we'll see a little bit, talk about the amount of blood that comes from the wrath of God during that time because of people's death, carcasses. Now, Numbers 14, now this is talking about the ultimate judgment, the, the, the past the, just the time of trouble. This is the day of wrath, the day of vengeance, okay? Uh, and yet, there's judgments in the past that picture this great worldwide judgment. Of course, chief of those may be the flood where the whole world died, uh, but the whole world would not die then as they will here. 
in the presence of the Lord. Okay. Uh, also, we, we see Israel walking through their wilderness, which of course we'll see multiple times tonight, that Israel walking through the wilderness when they came out of Egypt uh, is a picture, a shadow, a type, a parallel to this future time of trouble. Okay. In other words, this future, what we know as the tribulation, is dispensationalist. You could call this wilderness time for the remnant of Israel. You understand? So the remnant of Israel has to get to that promised land. Here's their time of wilderness wandering. And they face troubles just like Israel did the first time in the wilderness. Right? And so we'll see those parallels tonight as well. But in Numbers 14, remember when Israel in the wilderness came to the promised land, they sent spies in to check it out. The spies came back and said, this land is good, but there's giants in there. Their, their, their armies are too big. And uh, all but two, of course. Yeah. Right? And uh, because of that report, the people said, we don't want to go in right now, which was against God's will. Yeah. And because of that, God said, your carcasses will die in the wilderness. You, you, will, you will die in this wilderness. For 40 years, you're going to wander around until you die, and your children will go in. Remember that? Yeah. See, that's, that's kind of harsh. They disobeyed his will. He said, you're going in. I promised this to you. I led you through the wilderness. Here you are. And they said, no. Interestingly, and just like humanity, right after he condemned them to die in the wilderness, they changed their mind and said, let's go in now, like immediately. And God said, nope, <laughs> which teaches you something. When God says to do it, you do it the first time. Uh, because even if you change your mind later, it may not be the time at that point to go in. So anyway, there's a lot of preaching to Numbers 14. But you see the, the carcasses here in verse 3. You see the death here and the stink of the bodies in Numbers 14. There was a whole generation of Israel dying in that wilderness, yeah. right? Just, just a picture of the worldwide desolation that will occur here, okay? Um, look at Revelation chapter 14 real quick. I alluded to this earlier. Revelation 14 at the end. By the way, if you have a, a bookmark in Revelation, we'll be turning there multiple times tonight. So you might stick, stick around there. Revelation talking about these end of times, uh, just like in the past chapters we've studied, you'll see how Revelation does reveal to you uh, the, the chronology and, and different events that go on that the prophet spoke about. Revelation 14 at the very end of this chapter speaks about an angel coming out of the temple in verse 17, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle, an angel came out from the altar, which had the power over fire and uh, cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle saying, thrust in the sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for their grapes are fully ripe. If, if you remember the Battle of Him of the Republic, which was totally doctrinally ignorant, okay, talking about the grapes of wrath and the wine press of the wrath of God, this is the wine press of the wrath of God. It hasn't happened yet. No matter how many people died in the Civil War, which were, was a lot, yeah. okay, it was nothing in comparison to the people who will die here in Revelation 14. Okay. Revelation 14, the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, gathered the vine of the earth, cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God, and the wine press was trodden without the city. And blood came out of the wine press, even to the horse bridles, by the space of 1,600 furlongs. That's a lot of death. Okay? Uh, this is a time of death right here. A time of restitution, where dead people who deserve to die are living. That's going to be set right. And all the people that deserve to die will die. Uh, he will come, and just like in the garden, where everyone's questioned ever since the garden, where he says, if you eat of the fruit, you shall die. If you sin, you shall die. And Ezekiel says, the soul that sinners shall die. All the sinners are going, that's not true even though everyone dies eventually. On that day, God will come back and say, the soul that sinned as it shall die, and they fall down dead. Yeah. You see, what he said, he meant. And that's when things will be set right. You know, there will be no question in that day who the Lord is. And so, anyway, that's what's going on here in Isaiah 34, verse 3. Uh, chapter 19, you see the same thing. We won't have to go there right now. When the Lord, it, it talks about the Lord's return and, his, and what he looks like. And he comes back and he invites the fowls of the air to come eat the flesh of these men who are piled up because of the death that has caused by the, the, the sword of his mouth. A very vivid depiction here of his judgment. Isaiah 34 verse 4. Let's move on here. It says, all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. And this is where we include heaven in this judgment apparently. The host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. This is a fascinating verse. This is where verse 4, 5, and 6 are the deepest verses in this whole chapter. And we'll, we'll spend some time on that. Verse 5 talks about the host of heaven being dissolved and falling from heaven like leaves off a vine or figs from a tree. Many times throughout the scripture, 
in the Old Testament prophets and in the New. It talks about the stars falling from the sky, the moon turning blood, the sun turning dark, the hosts, the heavenly hosts, the celestial things God created are going to change, okay, during this time. This is why it's universal. You, talk, you read about the new heavens and new earth, as Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 3 in Revelation, right? Uh, those things will be adjusted in, in some way. There's a time in Revelation 21 uh, and 22, you don't need the sun anymore. Okay? Our, our whole solar system depends on this sun. You know, we don't need that anymore. Uh, so our, our idea of where life and light's going to come from is going to be slightly different, apparently, on, this, on, on the earth. So... Um, Isaiah 34 says, the, the host of heaven shall be dissolved. You can also speak about the host of armies from heaven. In Revelation, it talks about there being a war in heaven. And before the Lord comes to earth, he fights a war in heaven. And he fights that war in heaven, and there's no place found anymore for the devil and his angels and the spiritual wickedness in high places. And their high places come down to the earth level of high. And so he cleans out heaven before he cleans out earth. And so the host of heaven get dissolved. Okay, that has meaning that way too. It says, The heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. I said earlier, these two chapters, though fun to study, aren't that complicated to study. And this is one of those examples. There's only two places in your King James Bible the word scroll is used. So cross reference here is very easy. One of them is here in this verse, where the heavens roll together as a scroll. And the other one is in Revelation chapter 6. In verse 14, we'll start reading in verse 13. Revelation 6, verse 13. This, is, of course, is the sixth seal during this time of the Revelation there, where there's a great earthquake. The sun becomes black as sackcloth, and the moon becomes blood. Oh, you mean the things in heaven there start to change. And in verse 13, the stars of heaven fell to the earth. Oh, like the host of heaven are getting dissolved here. Even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs. Oh, that can't be a quote to Isaiah. Oh, it is. Isaiah 34, verse 4, when he is, she is shaken with a mighty wind, and the heaven departs as a scroll. John is quoting Isaiah 34. If you don't know Isaiah 34, how are you going to understand Revelation 6? You see? So once again, add to the list of things you've got to know from the Old Testament to understand Revelation. Or Revelation chapter 6 here, the heaven departs as a scroll and is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So there's the melting of the mountains. Right? And so all the elements that are here, you find in Isaiah 34 as well. This is the time of God's judgment, the day of his vengeance. Isaiah 34 is the time of his judgment, the day of his vengeance. The same elements are in both places. And the rest of that, Revelation 6 there talks about, in verse 17, the great day of his wrath is come, who shall be able to stand, which we spoke about last week, right, in Isaiah 33, that question. So you see there the host of heaven being dissolved. Now look at Matthew 24. I jumped the gun a little bit. I was going to walk you through the New Testament passages here and got too excited. But we'll go back and, and hit these two. Matthew 24 and verse 29. It says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. You see, the tribulation, the great tribulation that Matthew 24 talks about, that the prophet spoke about, that was, there's no, no such tribulation as great as this one. It never shall be. Heaven is affected here too, not just the earth. So it's a universal thing. The powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, which have departed like a scroll, right? And, uh, and it says, with power and great glory. And so um, that is this time here, of course. Where he'll come to rest it too. In this same context, down in verse 32, it says, learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender. Why is he talking about a fig tree in the context of the Lord's coming? It can't be because of Isaiah 34, can it? Isaiah 34 said, the heavens will be shaken like a fig tree that cast its figs. That's why Jesus told this parable of the fig tree. It's not a parable if you understand Isaiah 34, you that have ears to hear. Right? When does a fig, when does a fig fall off a fig tree? When it's done. When it's ripe. It falls down. You see, the parable's not that difficult. Okay. He says, learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. But the figs don't come out at the beginning of the summer. When the leaves come out, you know, okay, we're getting ready. You see the buzz, and the fig starts to grow, and then it grows, and gets ripe, then it falls. See, that, you know how fruit falls off a tree. That's all he's saying here. You've got to know the order of events. You've got to know what's going to happen. Isaiah 34 talks about what's going to happen. Revelation 6 talks about what's going to happen. Matthew 24 talks about what's going to happen. 
There are certain things that have got to occur. The leaves grow from the tree before the fruit does. Then the bud comes before the fruit's full. And then when the fruit's got to get full and ripe, before it falls down. Right? So when's, the, when's your coming, Lord? Well, don't you know how to look at the fig tree? Right? When you see the things in the host of heaven dissolve, and you see the heaven shaken and the clouds depart like a scroll, figs are coming down. Right? I'm not literal figs. We're talking about the metaphor here. Right? So people spend so much time at 24 trying to in interpret this fig tree parable. And if they would just realize it's talking about what happens in the timing of this, right? You'll see Isaiah 34 gives you an answer there. Mark 13, 24. We see the parallel passage here. Take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. In those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened. Here's the time of trouble, tribulation. After those days, the sun shall be darkened. The moon shall not give her light. The stars of heaven shall fall. The powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. See that? He'll send his angels to gather together uh, the elect, which is what Isaiah 35 is going to talk about. The return of the remnant, the gathering of the elect. And then it says in verse 28, now learn a parable of the fig tree. <laughs> you see, Jesus didn't say anything. That wasn't already spoken by the prophets. Amen. He came to confirm the promises and what the prophets spoke about since the world began. And so if you had ears to hear, which simply means you know what the prophets said, and you were part of the believing remnant in Isaiah's day, and not those that rejected Isaiah's prophecies, you would hear Jesus and go, this sounds familiar. In fact, because of what he's doing, this identifies this guy as the Lord. Right? And that was the whole key of Jesus' ministry, identifying him as the Lord. Let's move on here in Isaiah 34, verse 5. He says, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Notice the, the way the person, the, 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 the perspective this is being spoken from. This is God talking, right? For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. And he talks about the slaughter, the unicorns coming down, and the bullocks and the bulls and their lands will be soaked with blood, their dust made fat with fatness because of the great slaughter that's going to happen here. Okay? Um, let's talk about the sword of the Lord for a moment. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 41. Deuteronomy 32. The sword of the Lord. God is powerful, He's all powerful. Do you think he needs a metal rod sharpened on both sides to defeat an enemy? No. <laughs> so what is this sword? This is for our sake, because we understand a sword is a weapon. We understand a sword and a knife is needed to, to shed the blood. We understand that sort of thing. Deuteronomy 32, in the covenant God made with Israel, he says down in verse 41, he prophesies in the covenant here about this, this judgment. He says, it, uh, let's, let's back up to verse... Um, 35, just read this real quick. Keep this in our, in our minds. He says, to me belongs vengeance and recompense. That is the subject of Isaiah 34. Vengeance and recompense. And he says, to me belongs vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. The Lord shall judge his people. Right? Goes on to talk a little bit more. Let's go down to verse 41. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. Men don't, but God does. Right? If I wet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. You see here the word reward, by the way, in the context of something bad. The word reward doesn't always mean good. Right? The reward means payback what you deserve type of thing. It's like this is the consequence of what you do. You do something good, your reward is good. You do something bad, your reward is bad. Right? Here he's going to reward them that hate him with vengeance. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood. My sword shall, be, shall devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. Rejoice, O you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. Notice the contrast there. That we'll also see in Isaiah 34 and 35. He will deliver vengeance to his enemies, those that hate him, those who broke the covenant, those who don't want him. And then his people and his land he's going to protect. Now, the his people is the big question. Who is his people and how to get to be his people? Right? Israel was his people, not all of Israel, as we've been learning through Isaiah 28 through 35. Just certain of 
Israel who responded positively to the words of God. Okay, so let's move on to John chapter 12. Learn something else here about this vengeance that God's going to take, this judgment that God's going to deliver. In John 12, verse 48, <clears throat> Jesus, when he came the first time, did not come at, in the day of vengeance, okay? But he spoke about it. He spoke about him coming again, and he spoke about him coming to judge. He says in John 12, 40, 48, uh, 47 tells you about his first coming. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, meaning at this time, for I came not to judge the world at this time, but to save the world at this time, right? He that rejecteth me, John 12, 48, and receives not my words, hath one that judges him. What is going to judge the person that rejects Jesus? The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So what is the tool of God's judgment here? His words. He spoke words in the past, and they didn't believe them. Jesus spoke words to them while he was there the first time. They didn't believe them. That's what's going to judge them. Because they don't believe he's the Messiah. What he spoke was true. He's going to come back, and they're on the wrong side of that belief, right? Let's, Ephesians chapter 6, let's move on here. Ephesians, now, this is in our dispensation, of course, but we're just talking about the sword of the Lord here. And Ephesians 6, 17 talks about the sword of the Spirit, right? And the sword of the Spirit is defined in Ephesians 6 as, you all know, the Word of God. Jesus says they'll be judged by my Word, Right? Deuteronomy was the word of God in covenant for Israel. You see? So he talks about a sword there, and they're being, getting vengeance, but what's the basis of the judgment? What he wrote in that covenant. His words revealed this book, right? Jesus came and said, my words will judge him in that day. Paul says, carry around the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, defining God's sword as his words. Look here at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews defines the word of God as what? A, as quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So why would God want a real metal sword if his word is sharper than a two-edged sword? That would make a lot of blood, right? You see in Revelation chapter 1, this theme continues of what this sword is. Revelation 1 verse 16, this image of Jesus Christ here, the Lord, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Well, out of your mouth comes words. And we just saw a two-edged sword in Hebrews 4, being the word of God, right? His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 16. He says in one of the letters to the churches there, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. How is Jesus going to fight them when he comes back? He'll have a sword, and it comes out of his mouth. The sword is what cuts, slices, kills. That's why they call it the sword. That's why you have a sword, to cut and kill, right? But he'll cut and kill with the words of his mouth. So that's why they call it, it's called a sword. Look at Revelation chapter uh, five, or, uh, 19. Revelation 19, verse 15. Revelation 19 is the de description of Jesus' coming on this day of restitution, this day of wrath and vengeance. And it says in verse 15, after it describes his clothes and it describes the horse that he's on and everything else, it says, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. You see, so the sword he's carrying is out of his mouth. That with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. So again, the sword of his word. That's why I said before, he's going to come back and say, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. <laughs> That's all he's got to do, you see. And we'll see this happen in Isaiah 35 where he is leading Israel, saved Israel, remnant Israel, into this kingdom. And they're singing songs because they don't have to do anything. Because the Lord's going to go whoosh, whoosh, with his words, right? And so that's, that's the picture there. And that's why man without Christ is going to be hopeless. His word is what matters. Let's go back to Isaiah 34. He says, my sword shall be bathed in heaven. It says in Psalms, his word is settled forever in heaven. His word is known up there. And it's just a matter of time before his word comes to pass, right? And in this time, it will be bathed in heaven first. Then it shall come down upon Edomia, which is on the earth, upon the people of my curse to judgment. The people of my curse. Who are these people? Right? Who are the people of his curse? 
It says Edomia and the people of my curse. Now, Edomia, we'll cover in a little bit here, is Edom. Edom, Jacob's brother, which is Esau, had a nation like Jacob had a nation. Jacob had a nation, it was Israel. E Esau, his brother, had a nation, it was Edom, the Edomites. Okay? Genesis 36 says Esau is Edom. We'll cover that in a moment. But here it says it'll come down upon Edomia and upon the people of my curse. Who are the people that God cursed? Galatians 3.10 says those who are under the law are under a curse. God gave the law, right? And Israel is cursed by it. It's supposed to show them righteousness. It's supposed to help them. And eventually it will bless them and when they keep it. But it was a curse to them when they didn't keep it. Matthew 25, 40 and 41, this judgment upon the nations there. Jesus talks about them who are cursed going to everlasting fire. Why were they cursed? Because they didn't keep this law, that, these instructions I gave them. They were cursed. Deuteronomy 29, 18 through 21, and Deuteronomy 20, uh, uh, Leviticus 26 lists the curses. If you don't keep the words of this covenant, cursed, 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 cursed. So he says, my sword is bathed in heaven and upon Edomia and upon the people of my curse, which is to say the people who I have not redeemed, right? The people who are going to get the curse that my covenant said they would get. You better get out of that covenant. You better get into a new covenant, right? That was the whole point of being in that remnant, getting into the new covenant. Because if they're still in that old covenant, curse. The people of my curse that God wrote down to curse them, you see. They have to believe Jesus is the Messiah Amen. to get in that new covenant. So anyway, you have the people of my curse. That's who they are. And then it says in verse uh, 6, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood and is made fat with fatness. And we went to Revelation 19 already, and uh, we saw the sword coming out of his mouth. But we didn't read the passage there that spoke about his garments. Remember his garments? Revelation 19, verse 13, his garments were stained with blood. And man, the preaching from that verse out of context and wrongly, wrongly applied would say, well, this is, this is Jesus' blood because he died for the sins of humanity. He's not coming to save on that day. He's coming with the sword filled with the blood of men who are cursed, right? That's the stain of the blood of the up to the horse's bridle that he's stomping the winepress of the wrath of God. That's what that is. Yes, Jesus shed his blood for sins over here. And they rejected it. That's why he's coming to judge. You see? And you see that, that, that theme over and over again. His sword and his garments are bloody because, look at Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? Basra is the capital city of Edom. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteous, mighty to save, wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treads the wine fat? Why are you all red? He says, I have trod, trodden the wine press alone, and the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine angle, anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. You see? Why is his garment stained with blood in Revelation 19? It's not his own blood there. That's their blood. He's getting vengeance. Okay? You see what's going on? And by the way, notice what I said before about he won't need any help. Verse 3 says, I've done it myself. Of course he's done it himself. If you know about God's grace, he wouldn't have any other way. Right? <laughs> so no one on that day would say, I helped God <laughs> deliver vengeance. Uh, <laughs> no, he didn't. Nobody does. Right? And so the, the Lord's going to get his, the vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, Deuteronomy 20, 20 or 32 say, says. So, Anyway, we see that the fill with blood and why that's important for Revelation 19 has garments are stained there. Look at Isaiah 34. We, we saw Basra in Isaiah 63. Basra is the capital city of Edomia or Edom. Okay, and he says this in verse 5 and 6. He'll come down to Edomia. Then down in verse 6 is a, a sacrifice in Basra, a great slaughter in the land of Edomia. Okay, uh, the word Edom means red, earthy, bloody. We know Edom or Edomia is the people of Esau because Genesis 36, 8 very clearly says Esau is Edom. That's a quote in scripture. So you can't get that complicated there. This is what this is. And, um, and we see throughout the prophets prophesied destruction of the people of Edom, the Edomites. And you might say, why is God picking on the Edomites? Well, he's not picking on them. All of God's judgment is just. And this is the day of restitution, recompense, remember. 
And so the Edomites in this place gets this slaughter and judgment because of the history that they've had against specifically his people. So remember Genesis chapter 12 when God created Abraham and his promise there and the people of Israel. If you bless them, you get blessed. If you curse them, you get cursed. The people of Jacob, the people of Esau. And over and over again, there's this controversy. There's this opposition between Jacob and Esau. And it's not always that Jacob gets it right. right? Jacob lied, remember. I mean, Jacob the person lied. In the future, Jacob's people, the nation, they often did wrong. God had to punish them too. But there's a difference between Jacob and Esau and their nations, Israel and Edom. And that's Israel had a special promise that God gave them. A promise to bless them or I'll curse you. Right? Edom never had that promise. And so when people try to usurp the promises God gave us, not for them, that's bad. Right? Or when people try to resist the people that God gave promises to, that's bad. Right? That's why it's very important we get something right. Are you Israel or not? Who's Israel? Because God said you bless Israel, you get blessed. You get that wrong, you might be facing some trouble. Right? You better know what God's doing, who he's blessing, and how. But that's... I'm starting to preach here a little bit. So Isaiah 34 verse 6 talks about Basra and Idumea and talks about their destruction. If you want to read more about the um, reason why God's going to give destruction and destroy Idumea off the face of the earth, uh, read Obadiah. If you remember back in our Roman study, I say remember, I'm looking around here. This was some 10 years ago or some 8 years ago. We studied Romans verse by verse, and right at Romans chapter 9, we stopped and went to Obadiah. You say, why in the world would you study Obadiah when you hit Romans 9? That's because Paul quotes Obadiah, in Romans, or quotes Malachi in, in Romans chapter 9, and Obadiah is a short little book. It's hidden in there in this Minor Prophets, but it's about the Edomites and God's judgment against them, and what's in the middle of Obadiah is the reason why he's going to judge them. So if you don't read Obadiah, you don't know why. You think, why he's going to hate the Edomites? Read Obadiah. It tells you that the Edomites conspired against Israel to prevent them from following God's covenant and getting the promised land. Resisted them, opposed them, joined an alliance with other nations to fight against them. You see? And that's why Obadiah has this prophecy against them saying, God's going to judge you guys. That's why. By the way, Obadiah, most of it's quoted in Jeremiah as well. So you read it in Jeremiah's prophecy. You read it in Amos chapter 1, verse 12. Over and over again, the Edomites get this judgment. So this is just another judgment. Of course, Isaiah 34 is not just talking about Edom. Remember, it's talking about all nations. So Edom here is just representative almost. It's almost like this is the final place. It's not a coincidence, by the way, that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were in the location of where the Edomites were at. Now, no one knows exactly where Sodom and Gomorrah is at, but if you're looking at where they're at in relation to Israel and all that, it's in the same direction that the Edomites were at. It's interesting. Because we'll see in the passage tonight, similar depictions of Sodom and Gomorrah about Edom and about Basra. Okay, so look at Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. Micah is just a book or two after Obadiah. <clears throat> Micah 6 is most popular for the verse that talks about what does God require, right? Right? To do humbly and do justly, and you know the verse. But we're going to read Micah 6, verse 1 through 3. Hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy. This is the controversy the Lord has. Ye strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with his people, with Israel. He'll plead with Israel. O my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, redeemed thee out of the house of the servants. I sent before thee Moses and Aaron and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted. He goes on and talks about the things that he's done to help Israel, to bless them, to protect them. And yet what? You know what's coming. And yet they reject God. They curse him. They neglect him, ignore him. They don't offer what he said to offer and everything else. Which is why he asked the question, what does God require? All I require was these things to be, walk humbly before your God, and you couldn't do that. Right? That's the question. And so the controversy God has is this, okay, is that God promised Israel would be a blessed nation, and they'd be a blessing to the world. God promised it. No conditions. The controversy is Israel never lived up to it, never have, and never can. That's the problem he's got. 
And so here's the Edomites. They don't live up to God's standard. Here's the Israelites. They don't live up to God's standard. And the controversy is he's got a promise for these people, not these people. You see? And so the Edomites are going to claim, well, why can't we control Zion? Why can't we have the land? We're just as good as those people. Or just as bad. Right? Here's God going, hmm. Now, of course, God's wiser. I'm, I'm posing the controversy. We know the answer under this dispensation of the grace of God. There's none righteous, right? We know how God can save Israel. We know how God has through the new covenant and, and you know, will in that kingdom, right? It's by belief in Jesus as the Messiah and, and, and otherwise. We've studied in Isaiah 28 through 35 how to identify that remnant of Israel. If they hear the word of the Lord, if they believe the word of the Lord, if they trust the Lord, they wait on the Lord, right? There's those things that, that qualify and identify the remnant of Israel. It's, it wasn't in any of those chapters if they keep every law in the book, even though that was a requirement. Instead, it was waiting on the Lord, trusting on the Lord, hearing the Lord, you see, alluding to the need for faith, you see. So in Isaiah chapter 34, it talks about Idumea and uh, Basra. It says down in verse 8, it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. It's time for payback to set things right for the controversy of Zion. It's enough of this. Israel for sin, in Israel in Isaiah's day was wicked. I mean, wh why do they deserve to be saved? Right? They don't. Here's Israel here. Who deserves to be saved and who doesn't? That's the subject of these chapters in Isaiah. He's going to set the controversy. He's finally going to settle the controversy so that everyone in Israel will be righteous. So when I promise a blessed nation to be a blessing to other people, that's what they're going to get, right? And when I promise judgment to the wicked, that's what they're going to get. He's going to settle the controversy. Because before this time, that's the question everyone has against God. Why do bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people? Why isn't there justice in the world? And they ask it today. That's the controversy everyone has against God. And when God promised justice on the earth in Zion, and it hasn't happened yet, on this day of vengeance, God's going to recompense the controversy of Zion. He's going to set that right. You see what's going on in verse 8 there? So the slaughter happens in Edomia and in Basra. And this controversy relates to these brothers. Look at Hosea chapter 4. Hosea 4. It says in Hosea 4, verse 1, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land of Israel. That's the problem. That's the controversy. By the way, in the Bible, a controversy, we, we talk about a controversy as if it's some sort of argument on the Internet or something. That, that, that's, that's not necessarily the sense the Bible has. It's not just like, oh, we're debating something. It's, it's sort of that sense, but it's more of a legal suit. It's more like, I am taking you to court. Right? Which is, I mean, it's an argument. It's a debate. You will have a debate, the prosecutor and the defense. But it's like a legal argument. That's what it means by controversy. Right? So he says, I have a controversy. I have a suit open against Israel. I have a claim for justice. Right? Because there's no truth here. And, he's, and, he, and then, uh, that's with the land of Israel. Look at Hosea chapter 12, verse 2. Hosea 12, verse 2. The Lord also hath a controversy with Judah, and will punish Jacob according to his ways, according to his doings will he recompense him. We're talking about the day of recompense, the day of judgment. The controversy God has with Zion is that Zion doesn't deserve the time of refreshing. They don't deserve the kingdom. Even as late date as this, they don't deserve it. He's got to settle that. Okay? He's going to settle it by destroying them all and saving a remnant. Whoever gets purged through that fire. Okay? Look at Malachi chapter 1, if you will. It's the last book of the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets. In Malachi chapter 1, verse 2, this is the verse that Paul quotes in Romans 9. He says, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob. I hated Esau. Remember Paul quotes, Jacob, if I loved Esau, if I hated. All right. He wasn't talking there about the individual men. He was talking about the nations that came from them. Malachi was written years after those men had died. Centuries, right? He says, I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Edom saith, we are impoverished, right? But we will return and build the desolate places. But Israel is not. Edom is wasted. Israel's not wasted. By the time Malachi was written, Israel had returned to their land, you see. 
God says, I loved Israel. Even though you, you rejected me and disobeyed me, you broke my covenant, I had a, a promise to you. Edom I had no promise with. So they disobeyed me, they're gone. Look, and he points out how their homeland's a heritage, even to this day. It's a wasteland. People still live over there. Not like the Bible describes how it used to be, though. Okay, green and everything. So it, it's interesting that this controversy in Zion relates to these brothers, Jacob and Esau, Israel and Edom, or God and the nations here. And this, this year of recompense, this day of vengeance here, is going to repay all that. Okay. Edom then will be wasted for, uh, forever, and Israel, uh, the remnant of Israel, will get what God promised them. Look at Isaiah 34, we'll finish out the chapter. Verses 9 through 17 is a section here describing the, the, the desolation of uh, Idumea and the nations. And it says, The streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, the dust thereof into brimstone, the land thereof shall become burning pitch. That this, is, this, this should bring up images of Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire and brimstone is like a wasteland, right? Um, this is how Idumea is going to be. This is how the nations are going to be. You read Revelation, it talks about all the grass of the earth being burned up. And you're going, not good. You know, talking about the, the, all the, 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 the fresh water and all the, the seas, and it's just not good. Just being destroyed. The earth is looking not habitable by the end of those judgments. Okay? Some miraculous change has to happen after these judgments for the earth to start looking like a place of refreshing. Okay? And that's what's going to happen. Isaiah 34, verse 10, It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Interesting about this as well, this fiery, smoky place. Isaiah 66, we'll talk more about this in other places. There's going to be a, a temporary hell, so to speak, in this kingdom. It's going to be a time of refreshing. Christ is going to reign. And near God's kingdom here, there's going to be a place that will remind people of judgment and hell. And the transgressors in this kingdom, he'll just throw over there. People can walk by and witness. And this is this place here. The Idumea is going to be burning and pitched. It's going to stay like that. And around it's going to be all this green and all this refreshing. And they're going to say, look at that wasteland. Yep, that's God's judgment. Remember? Transgress me now. You go there. Right? And so th this is the picture. And Isaiah 66 ends with that, that, that picture. But Isaiah 34 verse 10, or verse 11 says... Um, well, verse 10 at the end, it says, From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Pass through. They won't travel through it. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. He shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion, the stones of emptiness. And it goes on to list quite a few other animals here. And the commentators spend paragraph after paragraph trying to discern what these animals really are. A waste of time. The point is... The animals that are dwelling here are animals that dwell somewhere that people don't. That's the point. This isn't like your pet cat coming to live because they're looking for food. Nobody's going to live. These animals there are there because it's a d desolate place. That's why these animals are going there. Right? They also happen to be unclean animals. Right? So not the chickens and the cows because, you know, they are the sheep. These are animals that are wild. These are animals that live in the wild or desolate places. And that's what that is. It says in verse 12 that uh, they shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom. They'll call the nobles of Edom to the kingdom, and, but none shall be there. And all her princes shall be nothing. Now this speaks to Genesis 36. If you go back to Genesis in our Genesis studies, we, we spoke about Jacob and Esau literally and their families and their sons. And Genesis 36 just lists a genealogy of Esau's family. Esau, after he didn't receive, after he despised his birthright and then refused the blessing his father wanted to give him anyway, he married someone outside his family line, a contrary to God's instructions, and then created all sorts of nations from his family that opposed Israel in the future. Genesis 36 lists all these princes and kings and nations that come from Esau. And princes and kings and nations that outnumbered the king's princes and nations that came from Jacob. And so that's the point of that chapter. So many more princes and nations from Esau than Jacob. And so if you're talking about being, you know, multiplied, Esau actually won that. But it's not the number, is it? And then you go preaching from there about it not being a majority and all that. But here it's talking about their princes being no more. So here, Israel is going to remain. Edom has no representation, right? And so it's not about the number once again. Because at one, one day, God's going to set things right. 
And so it says in verse 13, thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof, and it shall be a habitation of dragons and a court for owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island. And the satyr shall cry to his fellow. And people say, satyrs, isn't that a mythical animal? I mean, didn't we read about unicorns earlier? Isn't that a mythical animal? Well, it could be an animal that you don't know existed. It could be another name for an animal that you know existed. It could be mocking the mythical animals of the pagans. There's many solutions here. It's not, it's not happenstance that in the King James Bible, the note next to verse, uh, um, verse 7 here has rhinoceros as a marginal note in the King James Bible next to unicorn because unicorn means single horn. And they didn't put rhinoceros because there's two horned rhinoceroses, you know. So the one horned kind. It's more specific, you see. But the fact you think of a horse with, you know, the horn out of the head just means you believe in fairy tales, yeah. not the Bible. So be careful of throwing your Bible out. Um, Seder shall cry to his fellow, the, the shriek out, screeching owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather into her shadow. Why are these owls there? Because no one else is there. That's why they're there. There shall the vultures be gathered. Why are the vultures there? Because no one to shoo them away. And everyone with her mate. So all of these animals, which live in desolate places, are going to live there. And then God says, I want to make sure of that. Why would God want to make sure of this? Because his judgment's going to be sure. Now, verse 16 is a fascinating verse. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is instructive. This tells us, first of all, there is a book of the Lord in Isaiah's day. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 8, if you recall, God told Isaiah to write his prophecies down in a book. And so another way to see this is that Isaiah is saying, read what I'm writing as it is the book of the Lord. Just read what I just wrote to you about this place of torment and hell, this place of desolation, this judgment's going to come. And he says, read the book of the Lord. No, no one of these shall fail. What God says will be, will be. Right? None shall want her mate, for my mouth it hath commanded, and his, his spirit it hath gathered them. God will fulfill it. He hath cast the lot for them, and his hand hath divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. Talking about this place of desolation. Okay? And so th this is a fascinating verse there about seeking out the book of the Lord. God wrote a book. It was existed in the time of Isaiah. Isaiah contributed to it. He said he contributed to it. He knew God was writing this book. That's the doctrine of inspiration there. Okay, inspired by God. Now this chapter goes right into chapter 35 in the next, next 10 verses here because it talks about this place of desolation, this time of judgment. And in contrast to this desolation and judgment, you have some people rejoicing here in, verse, in chapter 35, verse 1. It says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. So in contrast to the desolation, you have this rejoicing. Well, who would rejoice at all of that? You rejoice if you understand he's setting things right and you know what's right. Then you rejoice. You see, if you don't know what's right, you're looking at this going, that's not fair. and This isn't right. And you know, that's always the response of people who don't know what's right. They read the Bible in the places where God judges and says, God's hateful and God's angry. And this isn't right at all. Well, if someone doesn't know what's right, that's the perspective, isn't it? But verse 35, chapter 35, verse 1, this is about this restitution from, from the side of those who will receive that kingdom. It says, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. This is what will happen to this, the, the judgment of God on the earth if God's going to make the earth a time of refreshing. If he's going to make the land of Israel a, a, a place, the desert blossoms as a rose. Okay? You're going to have plants grow apparently miraculously today people re take this verse and they say well this is today because israel has over the years developed te technology to irrigate their desert place and are now growing more oranges and bananas or, you know than they were before <laughs> well first of all they have not heard the word of the lord they've rejected christ secondly that's not god doing it that's them doing it right so it's not what the verses say it says the desert will blossom as a rose. 
Now, this wilderness and solitary place, both of the, the, the wilderness and the solitary place here refer to the place and the people that have been cast out of the land. In Psalm 68, verse 6, it mentions these people. We were in Psalm 68 last week, if you remember. Some of these psalms accord with these prophecies. Psalm 68, verse 6 says, God sets the solitary in families, those who don't have people, He gives them families. He brings out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. So the rebellious are in a dry land, but those that are righteous, right? If they're solitary, if they're alone because the rest of their family are the rebellious, they get a family, right? If they're in chains, they get delivered. Remember Isaiah 61? The Spirit of the Lord's upon me to deliver the captives and all this business, right? And so there's a discernment there in Psalm 68 between the rebellious and the righteous, and talks about the solitary there. So in Isaiah 35, the wilderness and the solitary place, those who are cast out in the wilderness, those who are solitary, are going to rejoice now because the desert's going to blossom as a rose. They're going to have a family because this remnant comes together, right? This nation comes together. The Savior is going to be there, right? And so they, they rejoice in this because that's what they were believing in, right? Uh, by the way, John the Baptist came preaching where? In the wilderness, right? He, he called Israel out. He said, repent, be baptized in the wilderness. So when the wilderness rejoices, who's in the wilderness? John the Baptist and the remnant. Right? You know, that, that, it's in the wilderness. In Hebrews, where's the believing Hebrews in the book of Hebrews? They're not in the city, folks. They're out of the city. They've been kicked out, you see. So when the city of Jerusalem that kicked the Hebrew, believing Hebrews out gets judged, who rejoices? These Hebrews scattered in the wilderness, right? And so you see, here's this prophecy about the wilderness and the, the, the isolated ones rejoicing because... They're the remnant. They're true Israel, right? They're the true people of God. And it blossoms as a rose. It says the desert blossoms as a rose. This, which should remind you of Song of Solomon, chapter 2. I am the rose of Sharon. I am the lily of the valley. Okay? That's not Christ. That's Israel. Read Song of Solomon. It's about Israel and Christ. And in that passage, it's, it's Christ. No, or it's, it's the it's little flock. It's Israel. Okay? Many people will make that verse the church. They'll say the church is the rose of Sharon. No, no, the church isn't found in Song of Solomon. That's Israel. Okay? The rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys, is waiting for the groom, who is Christ. Right? But it says here, it blossoms as a rose. And so what's going to come out of the ground? What's going to resurrect from the dirt? What nation is going to be built from the wilderness? Little flock, Israel. I'm the rose of Sharon, the, the, the Israel is going to say. We have come from nowhere. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Right? And then here comes Israel. Where'd they come from? Right? Out of nowhere. Right? Lily of the Valley. Right? That, that's who that is. Anyway, go back there and study some Song of Solomon back there. Um, that's that little flock. It says in verse uh, 2, It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. So you see the, the, the blossom is singing here. This is the little flock. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. They'll see the glory of the Lord. They see it. We believe it. We don't see it. That's not us. That's them who see it. And they see the glory of the Lord. Okay. Now, Lebanon and Carmel and Sharon are places around Israel. We, we covered that last week, if you remember. Last week, we dealt with Lebanon, Sharon, and Carmel all being uh, you know, under judgment. Okay. Here, these places are going to see the glory of the Lord. This is the northwest and south part of Israel here. I'm going to see His glory and His excellency. He says in verse 3, Strengthen ye the weak hands, and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that have a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense, and he will come and save you. So what's he say here? Strengthen the weak hands, confirm the, the, the knees that are weak, right, the feeble knees. Because Why? Because God will come in vengeance and recompense. We covered that last chapter, right? He will come and save you. Who's the you? That's these people. So there's desolation and judgment all over the nations. And these people, Isaiah 35 is speaking to, he'll come in the time of vengeance and recompense to save you. Remember Luke 21 says, when you see the, the heavens roll back, like, when you see the heavens open, is what it said, your redemption draws nigh. Well, when the heavens open, he's going to judge. But that's good for those who are on the right side of it. Right? And so they, he will come and say, by the way, notice what it says here. We, we read right past it because we believe it so, so truthfully. It says, who will come here? Who will come? 
God will come. Who will, who, who will come with vengeance and recompense? God. But we've already covered Revelation 19. We've already covered Malachi 4. Who is it that comes? It's Jesus. Jesus is God. That verse says God will come. But every other passage we reference in the New Testament says Jesus is coming. Jesus is God, right? The Bible teaches it. And so, he will come and save you. The you there is the little flock, the remnant of Israel, into that kingdom. Okay? Look at Hebrews chapter 12. We've got to go here, Hebrews 12, because Hebrews 12 quotes Isaiah 35, talking about the feeble knees and the weak hands. And it's not a coincidence that Hebrews 12 also gives you some of the same elements in Isaiah 34 and 35. Hebrews 12, down in verse, we'll pick it up in verse 11. No chastening for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. What chastening possibly could Hebrew, the book of Hebrews be talking about? Surely not this time of trouble and restitution so that afterward they get a peaceful fruit of righteousness. Yep, that's what it's talking about. This is not the church, folks. This is the time of tribulation that he's speaking to here. He says in verse 12, Wherefore, because afterward you receive, not now during the time of trouble, but afterward you receive the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Because of that, wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down the feeble knees. That's Isaiah 35. And make straight paths for your feet. That's Isaiah 40. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. That's interesting. Make your paths straight so that you can be healed. Wow, healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. <laughs> We've already covered how no man's going to survive unless what? Holiness. They need holiness, right? Remember that. What do they need? Holiness. We're going to see that in Isaiah 35. Okay. Looking diligently, lest any man uh, fall of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as, let's randomly pick an Old Testament person, Esau. As Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Coincidence, he mentions Esau, right? When Isaiah 34 talks about Edom and the day of vengeance? No, I don't think so. Jacob and Esau, and what happened there? When Jacob and Esau, when Esau sold his birthright for pottage here, pictures the coming judgment on the earth. And it's a warning to believing Israel saying, don't be like Esau, right? He had a birthright. He gave it up. He's talking to the remnant saying, you guys have a birthright. Don't give it up before you get it, right? Because if you're like Esau, you'll be the Edomites. You'll be destroyed on that day of judgment, right? For you know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Kind of like Numbers 14, where after God said, you're going to die in the wilderness, they said, oh, please, no, we'll go in now. And he said, nope, sorry. Just like that. You see, Hebrews, these references to Isaiah 35 and the, the, the elements here is not a coincidence, folks. Hebrews is a prophetic book talking about this day of vengeance, ta talking to this remnant about that day of vengeance, just like Isaiah 35. Okay. So it mentions chastening, Esau, healing, following away. You have to follow holiness without which no man should see the Lord. Isaiah 35, 9 and 10 is going to talk about a way of holiness that you have to be on or you won't get to Jerusalem. Okay. Let's move on here. It says God will come. We dealt with that already. By the way, this God will come, when it says God will come to save you, this cannot be the fulfill, can't be fulfilled by Hezekiah because God, didn't, God did not come to, to establish this. Right? He, he came and destroyed the Assyrians and left. And wicked Israel wasn't even destroyed then. Remember? All of his Jerusalem was, was still there. But in this judgment, true Israel and false Israel is judged. Okay? So it's not Hezekiah's day. Neither is it the return from Babylon. When Israel returns from Babylon, that's not the Lord either because the Lord didn't come when they returned from Babylon. Cyrus sent them back. Right? Some people read Isaiah 35 and say, well, this must be Jesus' coming over here. Well, that can't be either, as we'll see, because there's things that occur here that is not possible. Like the vengeance upon the whole world, for example, or that they're seeing the glory of the Lord, which we don't see now. Okay. Or the return of, of uh, Israel, as we'll see in a moment, is prophesied. So it can't be the return of Babylon or Jesus' earthly ministry or the church as people spiritualize this passage to be. 
This passage speaks so specifically about Jerusalem and Israel seeing the glory of the Lord. It can't be nothing else unless God's Word's not true. So seek the book of the Lord, and, and he says, none of, none, none of these things shall fail. Okay. Now look at verse 5 and 6. This is why people want to make it Jesus' earthly ministry. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. It says, Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. People write books about that. Streams in the desert, right? Where there's a desolate place in your life, in your soul, where you have a hole, God, God's going to fill it. You know, he's going to make waters come out. He's going to make blessings come out of your life, right? Spiritualizing the thing. And of course, Jesus came and healed people, right? He opened the eyes of the blind, op opened the ears of the deaf. Didn't he make lame man leap? Yeah. And we see this must be Jesus' earthly ministry. Well, what about the water coming out of the ground? What about the wilderness blossoming as a rose? What about Israel's land seeing the glory of the Lord? What about God coming to give vengeance and justice? That didn't happen, right? But here, the miracles of Christ and the apostles are indicated and performed by Jesus and the apostles as signs. Remember, Jesus performed these things when John the Baptist said, Are, ye, are you him that should come? Jesus said, look what, look what you see. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. And if you had ears to hear, you would go, Isaiah 35. You're God. <laughs> you see, so yeah, it was a sign to identify Jesus. But this chapter wasn't fulfilled completely in the time of Jesus' first coming. There's a difference. Okay. The fact that he's doing the same thing that God will do when he comes is indicating that he's of God, which is what he said. Okay. Look at Acts 3, verse 8, by the way. Acts 3, verse 8. Here's Peter in the ninth hour coming into the temple. This is after he has the Holy Spirit. If he has the Holy Spirit and the church began in Acts 2, wouldn't he know that he is the temple of the Holy Spirit? But he didn't. The Holy Spirit didn't even tell him that because he wasn't, right? He went into the temple in Acts 3, verse 1, right? Filled with the Holy Spirit, being the ninth hour to obey the law. A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them which entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. Peter says, we don't have gold and silver. I'm going to paraphrase a bit here. And then he says down in verse 6, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He took up him by the right hand and lift him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Like, you know, the feeble knees, right? Strengthen the feeble knees. Uh, you, you, you thought that was metaphorical. Like, you know, you're scared? Don't be. No, this is like this person can't walk, and now he can that's like actually strengthening feeble knees. He took him by the right hand, lift him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, and he leaping up stood. What did he do? He leapt. And he walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And Isaiah 35 says, the lame man leap as a heart. Right? So, did, is Peter fulfilling Isaiah 35? He sure is. The, the problem is, not every lame man leapt as a heart. Because Isaiah 35, it's talking about there being no sickness in God's kingdom. Right? It's not saying here, some shall. It's the lame man shall, the blind man. There, there's no blind, there's no deaf, there's no lame in the kingdom of God. Right? That's why that when Jesus did those miracles and Peter did those miracles, it was evidence that they were preaching the kingdom of God, and that the kingdom of God was coming, being preached through them. But it's not yet here because not all of them are healed. Today we have blind, deaf, and lame, which is to say we're not living in the kingdom of God. Right? It wasn't fully fulfilled, completely fulfilled. And yet, Peter makes this lame man leap in the same passage, and after he healed this man, he starts preaching, and what does he say? Repent. That your sins may be blotted out at the time of refreshing, at the appearing of the Lord, at the time of restitution of all things. He starts preaching Isaiah 34 and 35. Right? In the same context, he heals a lame man. I don't think it's a coincidence that he does the miracle in Isaiah 35, the same message he preaches in Isaiah 35. That's what Peter intended to communicate. Okay. Let's move on here, Isaiah 35, verse 7. It says, the parched ground, it says, waters will break out in the desert, streams in the desert, which uh, for people who live in the desert is a miraculous thing. 
You have water and you don't know where it comes from. We live in modern society, okay? But uh, in places where don't have, you know, indoor plumbing, you live in the desert, water is precious. And uh, there's a lot of uninhabitable places on this planet where you don't have water. You got to bring it with you. And if you run out, that's a problem, right? Uh, here, water will break, break out in the desert. Just like in Numbers chapter 20, when Moses hit the rock when he wasn't supposed to, and the water came out of the rock. There was no water around there, and water came out of the rock. God will provide the water. He'll make those things happen. It says, The parched ground shall become a pool, the thirsty land springs of water, in the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. No more desert there. Grass, right? And it says, a highway shall be there. A highway. That sounds modern. Yeah, we've read about a highway before in Isaiah. Isaiah 11, verse 16 talks about a highway the remnant's going to walk on. And Isaiah chapter 19, 23 talks about this remnant, this tent that's going to come back to, to, to Jerusalem in this, this highway. It says, this highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. Who do you think walks on this highway? The holy ones. Not the wicked ones. Right? Just like Hebrews says, without holiness, you will not see the Lord. You'll want to get on that highway and you can't get on it. Sorry. So it says it'll be called the way of holiness. And this highway is described like this. The unclean shall not pass over it. Now, this is contrasted to the last chapter. Remember? Edom, none shall pass through it. And there'll be unclean animals everywhere. Well, here, the unclean shall not pass over it, which means only the clean. Right? It shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. So even simple people, though they're fools, will not err. They will not make mistake. They will not sin. They will not, wow. That, that's special. How is that possible? Where in Scripture do we find people that are simpletons that start speaking wisdom and start not sinning? Oh, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit and his little flock suddenly get empowered by the Holy Ghost to live in one accord. And if there was a highway there, they start walking on it, you know. That's, that's what, what would happen. By the way, you might ask the question, as I just brought that up, if they're in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, why do they need a highway to get Jerusalem? Answer, they're not in Jerusalem in Isaiah 35. Well, how'd they get out of Jerusalem? Keep reading in the book of Acts. They get kicked out, right? True Israel isn't in Israel today. You think, well, where's Israel? In Israel, uh, uh, not according to prophecy. In prophecy, true Israel is not in Israel. Right? So, careful where you're pointing for Israel. Because they, they have to ride that highway back to Jerusalem, which means the people who are actually there are going to get judged. Okay? Meanwhile, today they need to be saved by God's grace. Right? That They can be. So, it says, The unclean shall pa not pass over. It shall be for those, the wayfaring men. They shall not err therein. No lion shall be there. Okay? Uh, by the way, um, I mentioned Numbers 20 and hitting the rock with the water coming out. Numbers 20 is also the same chapter after that water came out, where stream, water came out of the streams in the desert. Uh, right after that, they approach the land of Edom in Numbers 20. And they send, send people over to the king of Edom and say, hey, can we pass through the land? Because if you know in the map in the back of your Bible, here's the promised land up here, okay? And uh, Israel's wandering through the wilderness here, and this is the land of Edom. Okay, so they're like, well, we need to get up here, so we're going to travel up what's called the King's Highway. Even today exists the King's Highway. We'll just come up this King's Highway right into the land of, uh, of the Promised Land. Here's the Edomite territory. They ask the king, can we go through your land? We won't even touch it. They won't eat anything. We'll just go right through the King's Highway. No problem. And the king of Edom, brother to Jacob, right, said no. After multiple insistences, Moses is like, please, I mean, we won't even take anything to eat. Moses said, I'll walk with my feet just to make sure. No. So instead, if you go back and read the history, they had to go around the land of Edom. And people of Israel didn't like that very much. That's, they murmured quite a bit about that. But because the Edomites denied their passage, right? The Edomites denied Israel passage on the king's highway. What happens here? The king denies the Edomites passage on his highway. You see? The reverse. You see, he's restoring things, isn't he? He's making things right. All the wrongs that had been wronged, God will make right. You see, the time of restitution of all things. That's why that's good news, right? You praise God for his grace even today, because we've all got wrongs, and Christ makes them right. 
So he says, no lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up on uh, thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Right? And so you have the redeemed in this way of holiness here. He says, no unclear wild beast, which is a fulfillment of Leviticus 26, which says that if you keep my law, uh, I will have the wild animals. I, you will not run into wild animals. Leviticus 26, 6, my paraphrase there. They'll keep them away from them. The opposite of that, the curse was if they broke the law, wild animals would eat you up. And so, Leviticus 26, this way of holiness, there'd be no wild animals there. Uh, no, no lion, which you might think, well, that's just one of the wild animals. Okay, except that in 1 Peter 5, 18, the devil, as a lion, seeketh whom he may devour. Right? And uh, so, if they're walking on this highway, and here's the devil running around on earth, where can the devil not reach that way of holiness? Who's walking with them on that way of holiness, by the way? The Lord. The Lord's going to be leading these people on the way of holiness. Okay, and you can actually find, uh, and I don't have it on the outline tonight, back in Isaiah 11, we had the notes on the outline, the description of the path that Jesus will take to lead this remnant of people into the promised land, and it'll mirror the path that he took, led them out of Egypt before, and in Egypt before he led them with a pillar of smoke and a pillar of fire. And he'll come back in a pillar of smoke, and he'll come back with his angels, and come back and he'll come back to Mount Seir, to Mount Paran, to Basra, and he'll go up to Jericho, and he'll cross into Jerusalem, and the path is laid out in the prophecies. Read Judges, read Psalm 68, we've been there multiple times. Isaiah 63, Isaiah 34, talks about where Christ is going to come when he returns, and he's going to lead his people. Read Joel 2 and 3, he's going to lead his people, these people, into that land. And they're going to follow him, follow Jesus, right? Into the land singing, and he's going to be judging and the devil, the lion, isn't going to touch him, right? No wild beast is going to touch him, right? And there's going to be desolation where he judges, and behind him, as these people walk into the promised land, they're going to be rejoicing, and there's going to be blossoms. As a, and they're, they're going to be water-fed water, water fed and rejoicing, and, and yet the world's going to be judged, okay? Christ is their Savior. He's their pillar of smoke and fire. You can read, read about what he's going to wear. You can read about what he's going to say. You can read about what he's going to smell like. It's going to be a little bit like cinnamon toast. My wife laughed at me when I said this. But you read Song of Solomon chapter 3, and you read Psalm 45, and eh, I can make an argument. He's got cinnamon, there. he's got anointing with cinnamon and everything else, and so he'll come, and he'll come back with smoke and cinnamon. What do you call that? I call that burnt cinnamon toast. I don't know. But you know, you can, you can see what he's going to smell like, where he's going to be, where he's going to say, and all this is in the prophets. But if you don't read this stuff, you know, then you don't have ears to hear. You know, and so these people need to know who their Messiah is so they can follow him in there because their message is what? Believe the Messiah, follow the Messiah. Yes. You don't follow the Messiah anywhere, right? You're waiting for the Messiah to take you up, right? They need to follow him. So you see the whole message of follow Jesus? doesn't even work today because he's not here. But when he comes back, they will follow him on a highway into Jerusalem. And they better follow him because there's no other place in here that's going to be safe, yes. right? So Isaiah 35, down in verse 9, says, No lion shall be there, the redeemed shall walk there, the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And so this is where you can read Isaiah 61. Look, let's look at Isaiah 55 as we finish up here. Identifying these people, this remnant of Israel, getting what God had always promised them restored to the land. Uh, P Peter asked, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Not for you to know, Peter. But at that day, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom? He's going, follow me. We're going there now. Isaiah 51, down in verse 10. Art thou not it which hath dried the sea, the waters? Are you not God? The, uh, is not your arm the one which dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? You know, God's going to part the waters when they, He comes back for these people, just like He did the first time. Amen. Are you not the one that parted the waters of the ransom to pass over? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow, and mourning shall flee away. Isaiah quotes himself. He quotes himself in Isaiah 35. In Isaiah 51, talking about salvation coming to Israel. Okay? You can read in Revelation 7 about the 144,000 who are following Jesus in Revelation 7. And it says in that context that they're the ones that serve the Lord and follow the Lord into his kingdom. And there's going to be sorrow, sorrow no more there. It's going to flee away. No more crying. It's going to wipe away their tears. Read Revelation 21, verse 2 through 4. No more tears there. 
because they followed him into Jerusalem. No more sorrow, no more suffering. And so th this is the context of Isaiah 35, this everlasting kingdom where Israel becomes a great nation, a holy nation, a blessed nation, and a blessing to the world. So those that bless them get blessed, and, and uh, those who have cursed them have been cursed. Right? So that's the time of restitution of all things, and is the end of this uh, first major section in Isaiah. From chapter 1 to 35, we've we'll been working up to this point. Uh, 36, 37, 38, 39, the next four chapters will deal with a history of Hezekiah and, uh, and his kingship. And then chapter 40 is a whole new different section in Isaiah talking about the Savior and uh, the coming Messiah to Israel. So uh, we'll pick up 36 next week. Any questions or comments about these two chapters?